Well, welcome to, the, to today's seminar, and it's going to be on growth staging wheat, a, a close, closer look at what is actually involved in staging. And with this one, uh, you know, it's not going to be just about the staging, although that's sort of the key part about how the plant goes through various stages. I'm going to be trying to also include uh, some comments and some help in terms of making decisions relative to specific growth stages and what's going on. I'll be talking about the early stages of growth herbicides and the impact of herbicides. I'll be talking about fusarium and midge in terms of timing of those because uh, I go through a very detailed sequence in terms of how pollination takes place uh, so that you can actually determine exactly when a wheat uh, uh, floret is going to pollinate and time your, your treatments properly. And then I'm going to wind up talking about uh, protein in terms of how you might consider managing protein in your wheat crop uh, under various environmental conditions because uh, if you're expecting a protein supplement in, uh, on your wheat pricing then you want to make sure you're at least a 13 and a half percent or more and you can you can make quite a bit of money in some years on protein and we'll talk about the proper timing uh, for uh, upping the protein content in your wheat. So let's get going. Uh, as usual, we start out about uh, how a plant grows and you can see here the growth stages along the bottom and I'll talk about those later. But uh, basically we're gonna take you from the wheat seed right through to the plant that is going to be uh, basically dead at the end of the day and you're gonna harvest it. And we're gonna go through this growth period here where the plant will pick up most of its biomass uh, mature all of its reproductive parts until it pollinates and then after it pollinates the hormones change and the plant now is in the mood for filling its progeny its seeds and that's what makes all of us uh, farmers and agronomists uh, money from there on in it's going to start maturing that seed drying it down until we get to the end so we're going to talk about the various stages i'm going to show you the the collection of photographs i've taken over the last 10 years that basically pictorially show you what the stages look like and uh, uh, I hope you enjoy it and learn a lot. So we typically have this growth curve in terms of growing season which follows what I just showed you except when we get to flowering you'll notice that most things in biomass don't change a lot because at that point in time flowering the plant cuts down its nutrient supply to roots and is then although it doesn't quit it but it quits growing them in a large sense, in a large sense, and it starts pulling nutrients from its roots, of, uh, leaves, and and stems, and moving them in into the kernel field because we don't get really any biomass change, but we do still get an uptake in nitrogen to finish that that protein content uh, in the seed and to fill it to complete filling it. And during that period, we also have a change, of course, in the uptake of, of nutrients. And we can see that uh, <clears throat> big nutrients or macronutrients like nitrogen and potassium are picked up in large amounts up until heading, which you know follows what we've said. The nitrogen continues to go up a little bit, but the potassium, which is involved in basically uh, you know expanding cells and moving stuff, kind of levels out. The other thing, that a lot of people don't realize is that the uptake of phosphorus continues until the plant basically dies. Because the last thing the plant does is it takes some of that uh, nutrient at the end of its life uh, and it puts it into the seed and kind of stimulates it before it goes into total senescence. Now these plants, uh, are their, their term is called Marco, uh, monocarpic plants, are programmed to die. We know we've got a growing season of 100 to 120 days, basically, and some years more and some less. But genetically, it's programmed to die, and that's why when it starts maturing, it starts moving all those nutrients that it has accumulated, and that's really the part where the farmer has the biggest role because our inputs are going to be applied during that upscale season here, during what's typically called the vegetative uh, stage, but the vegetative vegetative stage is where most of the reproductive organs are actually growing and maturing uh, to a point where they're ready for pollination. So that gives you a general curves of, of uptake of nutrients. 
And on top of that, at the end of the day, you can see what leaves in the in the in the seed. We get 70% of the nitrogen taken up goes off as protein. Phosphorus, we move most of that, about 80% of it, into into the seed, and we leave most of the potassium in the straw and in the roots because it's they're not incorporated into actual molecules that go into the seed. They're left behind, uh, and their their function is processing the system. Uh, is done. So it's not surprising that we do see potassium deficiency, we see nitrogen deficiency on an annual basis uh, because we're leaving, a lot of it is leaving. We see sulfur as well de depleting and we see micronutrients and most other nutrients leaving, but we see fairly high levels of potassium. Uh, potassium always bothers me because uh, quite frequently we do tissue tests later in the season and plants are short of potassium. Uh, Sometimes that's because the plants just can't get it. So that's a little bit on, on the nutrients. Now, the other major questions I get are what, I sh what should I, what should my seeding rate be? <clears throat> well, man, that's a, that's a tough one. And, and I can tell you, everybody's got to figure that out themselves because every piece of land is different. But the general rule of thumb is seeding rate will be depending on your thousand kernel weight, the percent germination, the percent mortality, and the vigor. Uh, if you want a rule of thumb, I would say that targeting in spring wheat, and I'm only going to be talking about spring wheat because I don't have really any experience living up in Edmonton and growing winter wheat, so I haven't got that much of a background on it, but in spring wheat, uh, we want to be at least 30 plants per square foot. Uh, some guys are going up to 35. And I'm not as much concerned about that. If we're a little higher, the plants will figure it all out and, and, and competition will resolve what is a reasonable plant density. Uh, and you know, the higher the rate, the less tillers you're gonna have as a general rule of thumb. Uh, the biggest issue I think I've seen is that folks are underestimating the mortality in the field. They think that because it's 98% germination, that 98% of their plants are going to make it. So they say, "Well, we're going, you know, we we work in 5% mortality," and I think that's that's one of the big issues. I think mortality in wheat is more like 15 to 20% uh, due to a lot of things: poor soil contact, uh, wire worms, uh, disease, you know seeds bouncing out of the ground, seeds falling into the side band and being killed, uh, the odd seed being killed because you're putting some infro fertilizers. So one of the things I'd ask farmers to do, typically, or agronomists, is to do a, a spring seedling count and then mark that out and then do a mid-season seedling count in exactly the same area and then a maturity count. That'll, over time, give you a, a mortality count on that. And uh, here's here's a, a shot I took. This was some work I was involved in looking at uh, manipulator, and you can see the plants on the left are manipulator treated, and the ones on the right are are not. Uh, where I took the uh, a bunch of plants and I split them into primary, first tiller, and second tiller, and you can see that you don't get much from that uh, third tiller. So, you know, you do get some seed heads, but you sure do want to go past uh, 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 two tillers because the fourth is likely going to produce nothing. It's just going to cost you. And one other thing I would uh, just suggest uh, based on what I've seen over the years is uh, when you're combining uh, and you're, uh, you see that 120 bushel thing go up on your yield monitor, stop and take a look at your plants. Take a look at the number of plants you have, the number of tillers that you have, the seed size, uh, open them up, uh, and I'll show you what to look for in a minute. And over time, you will learn uh, what your seeding rate should be. For example, if you're getting a primary head and a tiller, man, that's the seeding rate you want. If you're getting a primary head and two or three tillers, then maybe you should up the seeding rate a bit. And you're only going to know that on your own field uh, by checking it, and you're going to if you're not doing variable rate or precision management, you're just going to see it at one standard rate. Uh, I took a, a plant with a primary head and, and a, a tiller, and these were under stressful conditions, but it, it shows you something. Here in the primary head, uh, because I'll be talking about setting seed in the plant, 
if you look at the primary head, uh, pollination starts in the middle of the head first. <clears throat> and the first uh, floret, this, this, this group is called a spikelet. And each one of these seeds would be a floret. And I'll show you that again later. But when you look at seeds in the head, you'll notice that these two seeds, the first two at the bottom of the, of the spikelet are gonna be the biggest. They'll be almost exactly the same size. The third one will be a bit smaller and the fourth one will be the smallest. You might get a fifth one uh, some of the time, but that's pretty rare. The difference between a really good crop and a poor crop is one seed. If you uh, get three in the main instead of four, chances are you're not hidden for a big crop. You're gonna need a bunch of fours in this middle to get a crop. But also take a note that as you move from the middle to the tips, you start reducing down to three, to two, to two, and the same thing goes downward, two, 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 three, four, and so on. So that middle chunk of your head is producing the bulk of it and many of your big seeds. And those are the ones I often tell farmers if they're using their own bin run, to go after by cleaning really hard. In the tiller, you immediately see the head size is much smaller, but also so is the spikelet count and, and floret count. So you got twos, 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 and I don't really want any of those seeds, or maybe these couple here uh, for seeding. So that's just another tip in terms of uh, looking for getting the best seed you can. So here's just a close up shot of what you get. You know, these seeds are big, and then this is a bit bigger, and this one's always smaller. And I'll show you this all the way from when the seed is pollinated. And this brush here at the end is, uh, is usually what I say, uh, the leftover remnants of the, of the stigma and the, the reproductive parts. Uh, and here's generally where, where we get most of our yield. Remember what I said, the plant dies. It's programmed to die. It's called plant cell death. So uh, in the end, the leaf, uh, and it's usually the flag and the, the second leaf that produce about 57% of the nutrients that fill the seed, the stem about 31, the head about 12, and I'll go get, show that again later on. And the only way you get more, uh, more crop it's a little different with wheat than it is with canola. Canola will, will branch and fill space. With wheat, you need more spikes, more seeds, bigger seeds or that combination. That's the only way you increase your, your, your volume of seed that you, you take into the bin. So it's important to have you know, nice big spikes, appropriate number of spikes, a lot of seeds that are, are, are big, and that's about where you go. One other key point <clears throat> is this, the K, K and O is a number of, of, of seeds established. Uh, the kernel number established is established about 20 to 30 days before flowering to 10 days after. This is where mortality is high because the plants, if it's stressful, are short of carbohydrates at that time. And you know, carbohydrates, the photosynthates, are made with a lot of nitrogen, a lot of nutrient and light. So that period during the, the growth in the boot, uh, up until pollination and after pollination for about 10 days is really key and you don't want stress at that point of time. The other thing that is generally also the rule of thumb is water. It is normally ex assumed that you want about one third of your, your summer water supply after pollination because it's a, it takes a lot of water to move all those nutrients into the seed and finish it off. If you go into drought, you know what happens. Seeds are small, they're high in protein, but they, they get shriveled and you get some abortion there. We're soon gonna get to, uh, to uh, what we started out on, but that goes fairly quickly. I just wanna show this for you. We just had this done with 2020 seed labs and. I'll just look at wheat and, and show you a few other key points. This is where we took the seed that we were doing vigor and germination tests on, and we knew we had high germination and relatively poor vigor, so we're trying to figure out what's going on. I'm not sure we have yet, but but I just uh, think this is interesting. Take a look at these two seed samples, and we, we don't have the details on exactly where they are from, but I'm, I'm getting those. We look at the aluminum, that's, that's pretty high, but we don't know what it should be. Boron, you can see across all these. And this is barley and these are peas. This is a yellow pea and green pea. Boron levels are 
fairly consistent, but look at the boron levels in peas. High. Calcium. Look at the calcium uptake in peas. Maybe some of you guys know all this stuff, but I, I sure didn't. Copper is pretty uniform across all, all species. Iron, pretty uniform. Magnesium, pretty uniform. Manganese, look at these two. We're, we're working on that one, but relatively uniform here for, for these other two. Cereals take a lot of manganese up. Phosphorus, pretty uniform. Potassium, look at this potassium in peas. Amazing stuff. Sodium, sulfur, a lot of sulfur here because we got high protein, but we have a lot high protein here. And you can see we don't have nearly as much sulfur because low protein in barley. Zinc, we got this big issue here. We know zinc is really key to, uh, to early germination and enzymes. And look at here. So the uh, reason I show this, it, I have always been a believer that we do soil test, tissue tests, and then we forget about the seed. And the seed tells us what is really important to the plant. So I'll leave it at that. So here we are. That's the preliminary. Now we're going to go through the stages. And uh, these are just general stages of, of uh, 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 that are used on cereals. Germination, leaf development, tillering, stem elongation, booting, inflorescence, emergence, and so on. Flowering and anthesis, development of fruit ripening and a senescence. So I'm going to show you all these. And you see this a lot, you know. And these are the growth stages here. They're called GS, but growth stages, but they relate to something else. So this is the typical growth staging chart. This is what is called the BBCH, which is a European system and it's very close for some of you guys that are are the Zadoc system. Now in Canada, not many farmers and agronomists use some of these kind of terms. So I'm always in a quandary as to whether I use them. So I'm going to, I broke them down into groups by seedling, tillering, stem elongation, and so on. And I'll show you this all in detail at each before I start and then show you what it looks like. And for some of you, if there are Americans uh, uh, listening in or, or taking a look at this in the States, I see that FEEX is commonly used. And FEEX is basically a uh, another way of of numbering and it's related more to to leaves than anything else but i'll use heading for example so here's heading stage six typically in fix it's 10 and zadox is it's it's basically in the, in the five so uh you know it's it's kind of strange uh, i like to use uh, bbch because with, when i was uh, in my former work, that's what we're using. But it's just a way of, of you know, 10-1 one, one just tells you that it's in a specific stage and it's 10%, uh, 20%, 30%, and 40% done. This is like 59%, 55%, and so on. So it's just the way to break it down into finer details. So let's let's take a look at germination, beginning of seed imbibing till coleoptile uh, penetrating the soil surface. And this is the last sort of table I'll show you. But this is a table just showing the, some of the splits in terms of nutrient levels in different parts of the seed. Let's look at the embryo, high in P, high in zinc, fair amount of K, a lot of manganese, a lot of boron. And then we have the rest in the endosperm and so on. And that tells me uh, what is important to the plant. And I know why this plant wants these things. It needs manganese for photosynthesis right off the bat. As soon as that leaf comes out, it needs zinc because zinc is involved in all the enzyme groups in the plant and the seed needs that to really get it going. It needs phosphorus because that's the energy that drives everything in the plant and it's also key to cell building and DNA. So every cell that's built needs phosphorus in all of those stages and boron is there for cell wall structure. So here's the typical system. This is just imbibing and starting to germinate, going through and starting to put out the roots. First thing the plant has to do is take up about 40% of its weight in water. That stimulates hormones to activate enzymes in the aluron. That's the only live part in the seed, the aluron and the germ. That then triggers the produce of what is called alpha amylase. The, the wheat seed stores plant, uh, its starches, as either 
uh, amylase or amylopectins, just longer chain uh, sugars. So the, the amylase breaks that starch down, produce sugar, glucose, in this, and that feeds it into the germ, which then supports growth. So here's a closer look at this. Uh, here's the aluron, that's the live cells. Here's the embryo, here's the scutellum. And when it germinates, the plant puts an, a germination node on the scutellum and it breaks down the endosperm with, with um, alpha amylase and it's hormonally controlled, feeding it there to support the growth of, this is the first true leaf forming here, will come up and this is the coleoptile covering it and the roots and the radical come out this end. So both of them are fed through the scutellum because the shoot and the root have to grow simultaneously. So one day I decided I would phone, uh, photograph germination of canola and wheat every three hours. So let's take a look at how a seed germinates. There we got zero, 15 hours. It's just swelling. By 39 hours, less than two days, this is at room temperature. We have the coleoptile forming. This is called the coleorrhizae here, which is uh, covered in root hairs, and the first root called the radical. The radical continues to grow, and these two seminal roots come out. Eventually, this become, these, are, these three are called seminal roots in 45 hours. You can see the root hairs here are quite developing, so very earlier on, you have that, and you can see that these are the next two roots coming out of that seminal root group. There they are, there's three seminal roots now and the coleoptile starts moving towards the soil surface and poof, coleoptile pushes through the soil surface over here. The first true leaf starts coming out and you're through germination. By then you have, or, or sooner, <coughs> very shortly after thereafter, you have five seminal roots, that's all that wheat has. And you can see, here they are, there's the node sitting on the germ right here. That's where it germinated. The shoot is going up and the roots are going down. And this here looks to me like a coleoptile tiller that is forming on that bud. Back to mortality. <clears throat> Here's some barley I was uh, playing with to show damage. Sometimes if you're, if you're putting fertilizer into a seed band, very tight in a three quarter inch opening, Sometimes it's just luck where a granule falls. A granule falls at the opposite end from the germ, no effect. A granule falls right at the germ, look at the reduction in growth that that causes. If you get enough in a, a fertilizer, depending on the fertilizer as well, you can actually cause seedling mortality due to salt index problems and, and just toxicity from ammonia and pH changes and so on. So that's why there are, are limitations on how much fertilizer and which ones you can put in seed in the seed row. So please pay attention to that. <clears throat> Here's some shots. And I always use urea because I know I can kill roots with urea. Just to show you uh, how the plant, you can see that these are three seminal roots and this one's almost dead. This one's burning off, but look at this one. It's going uh, way over here. This one here is losing one seminal root, but the shoot, is still growing. So when you're checking your, your seedlings, dig them up and if you're gonna have damage, you know, you're concerned about, am I getting any seedling damage from too much fertilizer in furrow? Uh, and the damage will be at the root tips. This plant will survive and it will put out a lot more uh, 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 root hairs there, but it only can produce five seminal roots. After that, it's gonna struggle. So some of these plants that are damaged uh, they may germinate and, and you may get emergence, but you're not going to make it. Leaf develop. Uh, this is pretty easy. It just goes from, you know, first leaf, it's 11, two leaves is 12, 13, and so on. So here's your first true leaf coming out of the ground. There's your coleoptile that protected it. First true leaf has got a blunt tip. Next leaf comes out. Third leaf comes out, and I always say, what happens next? Then everybody says a fourth leaf comes out, and that's true. Uh, so that's stage 14, four leaves. But what the trick is, is the first uh, pillar will come out between the third and fourth leaf right here. So I just want to switch for a minute here and talk about 
uh, herbicide hangover and lag because this is the time during leafing that most of you are putting on herbicides between say two and six leaf stage. And, and I should alert you that I know nothing about herbicides. Never wanted to, never will. Uh, because uh, you guys talk about them as though they're on a first name basis with them. Uh, and I know that uh, I never want to do that, but I did look into what herbicides do to plants from a, from a stress point of view. And uh, we, we know that we put on herbicides on the crop and that the, the crop is able to tolerate it because of differences in tolerance. But we also know that the plant can't keep the herbicide out. So the plant, uh, although you may not see symptoms, or you may see some symptoms, uh, deals with that uh, herbicide or that toxin, as far as it's concerned, it's a toxin. Uh, you get the benefit, even if there is a little bit of an impact, you get the benefit from early weed control. So earlier is, is usually better for weed control because the plant will become uh, very competitive. But whenever anything causes stress in the Whenever anything causes stress uh, in the plant, uh, it slows up things. So I just want to talk about um, what we can do to try and help those plants get up and going. So typically, when when a, a plant has to degrade uh, herbicide, it, it converts it and tie, or ties it up with something, and then it deposits it in the vacuole. It ties it up with an amino acid or a sugar or some sort of an enzyme to try and break it down, and then it compartmentalizes it in, in the vacuole uh, because there it's safe. So it takes a lot of toxins, whether it be heavy metals or, for example, it takes in a lot of excess nutrients when it's luxury feeding, and it stores it in the vacuole. Now, if it stores, uh, say, uh, a herbicide that's a, a soil applied herbicide in the vacuole, it has the option besides tying it and detoxifying it, of actually kicking it out, uh, potentially out of the root uh, through transporters, that's called a efflux of those. But the key ones that we need are, are N and P because we need N and P to build cells and we need the P for energy and we need the potassium to keep things and we need the sulfur to go with the N. We also need these micros, and I'll talk about why. Manganese, zinc, boron, moly, copper, and iron. <clears throat> now, all of these are metals except for the boron. And the role of metals in plants are for things like electron transport and for the oxidation reduction and enzyme processes uh, that go on. Now, boron isn't a metal, it's a metalloid, so it, it has other functions, mostly in building cell walls. Zinc uh, does not uh, change its valence, but it's really important for a whole bunch of things. So what we gotta do is get those plants up and going, because remember that curve. We don't wanna delay that curve because our season is short. So every day that we can reduce any kind of lag, we're off and running. Now, because I admit I don't know much about herbicides, I went through literature and I looked at uh, two groups that I want to talk about, and only two groups as an example. Uh, there's group five, six, and seven, which are photosynthesized inhibitors, photosynthesis inhibitors. And then I looked at the cell membrane disruptors, which are called the PPOs. And I'm sure most of you farmers know those too. And I'll just use those as the examples uh, because I know what they do. So here's a cell. And here's the vacuole, and here's the chloroplast where uh, a lot of the, where all the photosynthesis takes place uh, in the plant, and that's where we're going to go. So here's a chloroplast where photosynthesis takes place. And this has to do with the, the group uh, five, six, seven, which inhibit photosynthesis. And I'm going to show you exactly what happens. We have two photosystems there. Photosystem two is where photosynthesis starts, even though it's called two. Photosystem one was just discovered earlier, but uh, photosynthesis starts here. And, and there's a, an electron transport chain that's involved, which moves ATP over to, and, and then what, those electrons produce ATP and NADPH, which we won't worry about. And then it moves it over here where it takes in CO2 and makes sugar. Now, for you folks, uh, I think we've launched our my cell presentation. I have a whole, uh, webinar on the cell. 
if you want to follow this and you don't have to remember this, but you can always go and look at this again. So the way the uh, the herbicide work, that group that uh, affects photosynthesis, group five, six, and seven, a little bit, here's photosystem one where we get an electron activated and it's got to transfer through the, the membrane through something called plastoquinone. Well, that group of herbicides blocks this so that it can't, can't transfer that electron here to photosystem two. That causes a lot of stress in the plant and causes a lot of what are called superoxides that are produced uh, in the chloroplast. And I'll talk about that in a minute, just remember. So that's how it actually kills uh, the plant. If it cannot transfer that electron, there's no photosynthesis taking place. The PPOs though, they uh, are, are, are cell wall problems. So what they do is they damage the lipids here in the, in, the, in the membrane around the cell. So the cell becomes leaky and it also will damage the membranes here in the vacuole where it's storing things and it becomes leaky and that's how it kills the plant. So what does the plant do? <clears throat> For example, if we got a plant that's, that's under some stress and maybe it's, it's trying to deal with some of these because the dosage is too high or it's all under a lot of stress, the plant uh, is, is well adapted at, at dealing with those herbicides, but there are certain things it does. And this is generally the accepted across stress in the plant where generally stress causes uh, uh, photosynthesis to be uh, affected and electron transport. It produces, using sulfate, it produces a compound called glutathione, which it then uses to circulate throughout its system in the xylem and phloem to measure levels of sulfur. It forms something called an ascorbate glutathione pathway, which scavenges those free radicals. And I'll show you this in a minute. And here, glutathione peroxidase, glutathione reductase. And it also has a whole bunch of other things, including vitamin C, vitamin E, and glutathione that it uses. So sulfur is key in scavenging those free radicals that are produced. The other nutrients that are key are what are called superoxide desmutases. And where it takes that superoxide, combines it with hydrogen, produces hydrogen peroxide, and then breaks that down to water and oxygen. And look what they're made of. Manganese, manganese sod in the mitochondria, iron sods in the chloroplast, copper zinc sods in both the chloroplast and the juices right inside the cell. These functions to scavenge all of those reactive oxygen species, which in humans we call free radicals. And we use these same nutrients, micronutrients to do that in humans. And that is the reason why we uh, have got foliar nutrient products to put in with, with herbicides to reduce the length of time that the plant may be under stress, if there's a tiny bit of damage or just the activity of metabolizing it becomes a problem. A lot of phosphorus to manage all that extra stuff and all those nutrients have a role. So let's get on with tillering. Now tillering is depending on plant density and nutrition largely, but gen genotype is also Im important. Uh, so we talked about plant density and we're talking about nutrition and uh, uh, the only thing I'll say about nutrition in terms of, of tillering uh, is this. If you want to increase tillering in a plant, say you've got poor germination, um, poor seed growth, for example, seedling growth, and you want more tillers, put on a fairly significant level of nitrogen at about the three leaf stage. Uh, the plant will then think it's got a lot of nutrients and sp spin out more tillers. Uh, and then look at your, your density uh, uh, seeding rate. And if you're getting too many tillers, increase your seeding rate. Now, <clears throat> here's where a tiller starts. This is the uh, crown uh, root node. The tillers all start from the crown root right here. This is in the wheat, you can see this tiller 
has a caldeoptile of its own called a profil, and it's got this nice green vein on it. So this is tiller one, tiller two, comes right from the crown. So if you're confused, you just pull off all those loose leaves and take a look, see, same thing right there, coming there. And it's called a profil, very common. Uh, some people know about it, some don't. Now here's the crown node, and this is the intercrown uh, space here. So when we plant a seed too deep, it puts in this inner crown node, and that's where the crown uh, node sits, just below the soil surface. So here's the crown node starting to form roots, because now we have tillers. And here's a, a coleoptile tiller, which can occur as well if it's too deep or planted too thin. So the, the tiller actually comes from where the seed started. Here's another example. You can see the seed here. Here's the crown root where the tiller is is also coming from, but there's a crown or a, a coleoptile tiller that starts right from where the seed was. And that's not all bad. I mean, I see it quite a bit up, uh, in wheat if uh, I've got uh, either seeded too deep or, or too small a density. And you can, you can see this one here as well coming from down at the seed. But typically, here's what we got is the first tiller, and there's that profile. Uh, then we continue to get other tillers until we get two tillers. So we get the first tiller between the third and fourth leaf, the second tiller between the fourth and fifth leaf, and we would get the next tiller between the fifth and sixth leaf. If we don't have a tiller going by the fifth and sixth leaf, uh, we're good to go. So there's just one tiller. There's your second tiller coming out there, and you're done tillering. So the plant isn't going to move the seed head up until it's finished tillering because that takes a lot of energy. So once you have your last tiller done and you start moving the seed head up in stem elongation and you think you're short of nitrogen, that's when you can put it on to increase the amount of biomass you're going to produce. Because at that point in time, once we get stem elongation, it's not likely going to till it. So at this point, the spike is grown below ground. Uh, it grows fast and rises quickly. And I'll show you that. It's sensitive to stress at this point in time, especially water and nitrogen. So uh, you want to make sure. And that's why we put on most of our, our nutrients up front, the NPK, the big ones, and even our micros sulfur and so on, we put them up front because the plant needs a lot of it up early and it's cold and the roots are growing slowly and logistics wise, that's how we do it because we have to. But by now we're getting, if we're finished uh, uh, tillering, <clears throat> we're getting kind of late in terms of tissue testing to, to boost it then. So if you're gonna tissue test, go at about, oh, I know, four leaf stage, five leaf there before we get into stem elongation. That'll give you a handle on how much nutrient you have there to support the expansion and growth, the, the elongation, which typically referred to as, as jointing, uh, actually will move the seed head up. And you're starting to limit your herbicide application because at this point in time, once you start playing with the seed head, uh, I don't, myself like to see stresses on the plant if at all possible but like i said if if, if it's registered then they know that it's not going to hurt it and by uh, you should have your end on by now as i said so this is the growing point of wheat before the head is formed here we are at stage 31 <clears throat> which you can see this is the ground level here this is one centimeter above the ground so that's stage 31 one centimeter above the ground, there's the size of the seed head. There's one and a half, so we're one and a half centimeters above the ground, but we got quite a big head. And that's just the size of the head here. It's, it's about a centimeter long too. Now, this is when you put on manipulator. If I'm not, we don't sell manipulator, but uh, I thought it would be good to just show you that that's how early the manipulator goes on to shorten the stems. And these were just north of Edmonton here in Morinville. Back a few years ago, I was taking shots of what manipulator did, and you can see it knocked down about four inches off plant growth. Then it moves on to stage 32, where we got uh, two nodes, and it's two centimeter above the ground. And at that stage, here's what we have. We have uh, all the 
spikelets are formed. All the seeds inside the spikelet are in the embryonic stage and being developed. These are all the spikelets or florets that are going to be in each spikelet. And right at the tip, this is what at the tip, and these are the two glooms. And this is the, the really growing point where the actual uh, cells are developed in that head. And it's still growing, but the actual number of seeds that is maximum have already formed. Then we move on to 33. Now it's three inches above the ground. And that's the last node in wheat, and then it just starts stretching out. The seed head continues to grow. And you can see that it still looks the same. There's not much development that's taken place. We get the inner nodes moving. And then this is the shortest node. This is the second shortest node. And this one here becomes the peduncle, which is the longest node and gives you that long whippy head so that the plant can bend in the wind. You move up and it be, moves, starts forming the boot. And you can see that this is the penultimate leaf, the second leaf from the top. The flag leaf is still straight and the uh, uh, legule hasn't really shown. So there's the flag leaf still up straight. And we can see that the seed head is starting to now form. And this is the early seed head with the stigma and the embryo here. At that point in time, you can see the legule. When the legule becomes visible, you know you're just about approaching the flag leaf stage. And there, these are the oracles that clasp. And like in corn, this is the collar, which is on the base of the leaf, which will allow the leaf then to flop down. This is another shot showing the way the uh, oracle wraps around the stem. Sorry, around the, the uh, the head. So here we have now we've 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 got the flag leaf out. Here's the boot. It's swelling, and here is the penultimate leaf. That's the end of that stage. Now we're in the early booting stage, and this is where you get that 20 to 30 days before flowering to 10 days after is really important because this is where we are actually starting to really expand the anthers, the stigma, and the ovary inside there, inside uh, the boot. You can see these are the anthers that are forming. This is where the pollen is. They're white, and they got to mature. This is at stage 46, 47, where we can see, and, and you want to watch this from now on. Pay close attention, because this is where you can learn how to stage wheat so that you can time your fusarium and midge properly. You can see that the stigma is very fine and it's extremely tiny. You will be looking at flag leaf protection at that point in time so that you don't have disease which is going to interfere with photosynthesis because this is the wheat leaf and you can see these are all the stomata. and These are the veins right here. So when you get leaf disease, it removes both the stomatal amount of, of water that can, can leave the photosynthetic area, and it puts stress on the plant. Now, the plant has lots of, of genetic activity in terms of managing this, but it still stresses the plant, takes energy. So we want to make sure the plant has got a lot of energy in your tissue testing. So we're starting to move into heading, and this is just uh, going to emerge. So the boot growth fast uh, from legule visible on the flag, which we've just seen. Florette death in the boot is due to carbohydrate storage and anid at swollen boot for protein. So once you get to this point, uh, you have a choice. If you think you haven't got enough nitrogen in there to get to your protein level, you can put on nitrogen at the swollen boot stage and get your nitrogen level up into the flag leaf and the, the sheath of the flag because the sheath of the flag is what contains the boot. And, uh, and you can get a lot of nutrient into that large massive area. <clears throat> and eventually it's that sheath of the flag and the flag leaf that really puts a lot of nutrient into the seed. So this is the time you can swing, uh, swing on some um, nitrogen, typically UAN is used or, or or liquid uh, melted, uh, not melted down, watered urea in a water solution. 
can go on at this stage. And if you can you get your, or if you do a tissue test on your flag leaves and work done mostly in Montana and, and uh, North Dakota shows, if you have about four and a half to 4.7% nitrogen in the flag leaf, you have enough nitrogen in that plant to get you to about three and a half percent protein. So what's the issue with protein? Well, when you get, when you, when you fertilize for 50 bushels and you get lots of rain and you get 70 bushels, you grow more biomass and you haven't got enough nitrogen to go around to keep the protein up. So as a result, you're gonna have low protein. The only way you can deal with it at that point in time is put on enough nitrogen. And it takes about 20 pounds of nitrogen to move percentage wise, three quarters to 1%. Uh, and you have that option at that time. And I'll tell you about the next time you can put on nitrogen in a minute. Now we're going to heading, and this is easy. This is heading, so beginning heading, and then 20% out, 40% middle head, half emerged, and then it's out. So this is what it looks like, 53, 30% uh, out. You can see the legule and the flag leaf has flopped down. 50% out, about 80% out, and boom, it's out. So I would say, well, what happens when it's out? Well, everybody says it pollinates, well, not so. Here's a, a better shot. It's not a great picture and I should redo it, but it works. Here's your head coming out. So that'd be like 30%, 80%, 100%. And then what happens? It pushes up. It pushes this peduncle from the last node. It keeps growing and pushing it and pushing and pushes it up at about an inch and a half a day for a period of about five days if it's cool and you've got good nutrition. If it's scorching hot, oh, and like if it's cool and good nutrition, it'll grow it up to about five inches or six inches, <clears throat> and then it'll pollinate. If it's scorching hot, it'll pollinate very, very quickly, almost as soon as it emerges. So the time of pollination can be dependent on the environmental conditions that the plant is growing under. <coughs> now, as soon as that head emerges, and you can see what stage we're at, you can see this is not even out of the boot, and here are all the midge. So as soon as the head is out, the midge start laying eggs on it. So midge damage is coincides with early stage of head emergence. Once you have the anthers starting to show up big time, even if midge does lay eggs, the damage will be a lot less. And we saw, and when we had that big outbreak in the piece, uh, we got a lot of rain in the spring, it delayed emergence, so the timing was perfect. And we had midge there waiting when the heads came out of the boot. So that's really important. If your heads are already out and you got your anthers showing, man, that progresses very quickly and usually the damage is a whole lot less. So there's a female laying eggs uh, and the timing is perfect. You wanna look at the the maps that are produced, and if you're big scale producers, you may want to get some pheromone traps and monitor your mid situation. The next one we're going to look at is timing for fusarium, so that uh, you're thinking about it as I go through how a uh, plant pollinates. So we're looking at 75% of the heads on the main stem are fully emerged to 50% of heads uh, on the main stem are in flower. So we want to see them in, in partially in flower, but you know not too much. We want the heads out, and we want them not past about 50% uh, right here, day two, 50% pollinated. Now, I think some of this is varying. This is out of Saskatchewan government, and I, I, I haven't got time to get into all the ins and outs of this, but uh, that's generally the rule of thumb. And regardless of eventually at what stage you want to spray, uh, you need to know how to figure that out. So here we go. Uh, well, before we go there. So here's, here's some damage by, by uh, fusarium right here. You can see this one here got whacked off right here and it's all, all, all dead. And you'll, you'll see that and I'll talk about it. And then you get this nice orangey type of uh, material uh, spores forming on the outside of, of the kernel. So here's, uh, here's pollination. First flower, visible 50%, and then all spikelets are completely uh, uh, out. But I'm going to spend a lot of time about inside that florette. So here's a spikelet. So you got 
four florets here, and each one of these is a floret. So we're going to monitor what happens in one of these florets. And inside the floret, you have the seed with the stigma here, and then we have the anthers. So this is what it really looks like. If you look inside that floret, you got an anther, you got the stigma here, and this is uh, just showing you, I'll show you how it develops. And then you have these bulges here called lauticles. And the lauticles are used to eventually open that floret so the anthers can be extruded. And then the seed develops here above the lauticle in the back here, and this is the stigma. So here are the glooms. There's two glooms, one on each side of that whole floret, and then each are seeds, and then each seed is covered by the outside uh, part called the lemma, which has the on, and then the pellet inside. So we'll look inside. And the, that sits on the rachis node. Down the middle of the head uh, is a rachis node, so that group of florets sits on this node. So the plant has to move all the nutrients up into there and feed each seed. Now you saw that one head where it was three quarters dead. If fusarium cuts that off there, there's no nutrient flow here and the plant can't fill it. So you get the whole dead head. Now what the other thing is this, that all those florets that sit on this node, remember I told you and I'll show you it again, the first two that are pollinated are the biggest and in the middle. Well, that's why, because those first two get access to the most nutrient early in what the plant is moving. As the plant is moving nutrients from its roots and bottom leaves, as time goes on, it's got less and less nutrient to give. So those first seeds are the ones that are the biggest and most nutritious likely. So here we go, we're at BB49, we're, we're starting to develop and, and at this point in time, train one of your kids, let them watch this video and they can go out and do your staging for you. Start in the middle of the head and take a floret and just open it up and look inside and this is what you see. Uh, watch carefully. Here the anthers are green, there's three of them. The stigma is very tight right here. This, this is the stigma that's very, very tight and small and, it's, and the anthers are, are dark green. Another shot, and you can see that already it's starting to get shiny. It's putting nutrients into that stigma. It's putting things like boron in there. It's putting in calcium in there, all kinds of nutrients. Again, it, the anthers are green. You can see that inside there, you can actually see the pollen. This is starting to expand. You can see this is expanding to this, is becoming feather like. And here are the three anthers starting to expand outside of the anthers, like that. So once you see that moving, they're, they're growing bigger, getting ready to receive the pollen that's gonna come from the anthers. Once you see it moving out of there, you're probably two days away from pollination. As time goes on, the anthers are maturing and they're starting to turn yellow and the stigma is getting all covered with juices, brighter yellow. And then the tip of the anther opens and you can see the pollen is all mature and this is all bright you can see the flash from the camera is or from the microscope is showing a, a reflection so now what will happen is these uh, pollen grains will be attracted to this because the plant dried out the pollen grains as a, a way to survive a long period of time the stigma is expanded to take on those pollen grains, I, I throw this in for corn for you corn guys so you're not left out. Uh, the tip of the stigma there, because corn needs a lot of pollen to reach every one, one grain to uh, tube to every kernel, it has a mechanism to catch them all too. So here we see the pollen actually in the air being attracted to the stigma and lo and behold, there they are. All these pollen grains are hooked to the stigma. Give you another shot, lots of them. There. So now what the plant does is it has to have germination of one pollen grain, grow down this tube and take its nu uh, nuclear material into the actual ovule to form the, the germ and the endosperm. It only takes one grain. So only four, if you got four seeds, it only takes four pollen grains to make it to pollinate wheat. That's why wheat pollination is pretty good. There's a lot of grains in there and it's tight, protected inside of that floret. Once that's done, it, ex it expands, it opens that lauticle, swells, opens it up and out pops the anther. 
when you see the anther outside flopping in the wind, you know that pollination took place. And you can tell even, and I'll show you that in a sec, uh, how long ago it took place. And this practice of, of extending that takes about 15 minutes. It usually happens about 10, 11 in the morning. It's very quick. I'm going to photograph that one day. And you can see here that that uh, anther is attached to the base of the seed. This is showing how it's been extruded, and you can see that the tips are all open and all the pollen is gone out of it. There's a little bit stuck in there. I think I show it. No, that one's there. You can see that this is yellow. That means it was just extruded. You can see that there's some pollen left in some of those. Now the plant is going to start pulling back the anthers and disintegrating it, and then that's what you see. So by the time you see this, you know that that florette has been pollinated. So if you're going to try and time it and you want to get it to this stage, you can take a look at inside those florets. When you see the stigma expanding, the anther yellowing, you know that probably in 24 hours it's going to pollinate. You go out there the next day and you see one, you know you're in the rest, you take a look at your tiller, it'll be three or four days behind depending on, on your your philosophy about managing things, you can make a decision on when to treat it. When you see this, you know it's totally pollinated. And if the whole plant head is covered like that, you know you probably missed the boat. And this is a good example. You can see that this one was just pollinated. These old white ones are all dried out and bleached and done. Now, when when fusarium uh, spores sit on the uh, at this point on this uh, anther, there's a lot of nutrient left in there, and they use that nutrient to actually grow and send the hyphae down that uh, uh, filament and into the seed. So it can attack the seed uh, that way, forming what we used to call those blasted uh, tombstones. Uh, so that's how it can get in there. Now, we're going to move on um, here and just show that because the reproductive stage is so critical that the actual uh, number of micronutrients that are uh, in the reproductive part increase drastically compared to vegetatively because uh, things like boron are involved in pollen tubes and oxygen and sugar, zinc, in, in a lot of enzymes and pollen, manganese as well, copper, and calcium. Uh, calcium is really key because of the uh, pollen tube uh, depends on, on, uh, on a lot of calcium in its growth, and I'll show you exactly how that goes. So here we now have a pollen grain and it has one opening in wheat. Uh, this is a general term. So we have a nuclease in the pollen grain and, and it's covered with, with a coating to protect it. And inside of that, we have a, what's called a germ cell, which is a nuclear material and a tube cell. Now, the only other uh, cell that grows uh, by in this system is the root hair is a single cell. So they grow in a similar way. Now, as the pollen tube is growing, and remember all that shiny stuff that was on the stigma, that's where the plant was putting a lot of nutrients and sugars, because the pollen tube has to feed as it moves through that stigma down to the ovary to take this genetic material and cause pollination to happen. So the plant has to load up that anther and stigma, or anther, the stigma and the style, that, that's the shaft that goes down to the seed, and it pulls the nutrients from there, and on the way, it splits the sperm cell because there's a double pollination that takes place. And on the way down, it plugs it behind it and it moves all these nutrients down here in the vacuole and so on, and there's a lot of activity at the tip. And you can see the two sperm cells are moving along here, and this is growing down the style all the way down to the ovule. And I'll just show you this, and, and, and you'll be clear when I'm, I'm done. So this is the tip of the pollen tube, and, and the bright red indicates calcium levels. So we have a tremendous amount of calcium being taken in here through all these transporters, and we got also calcium coming in from the vacuole and behind feeding in into calcium into the, into the wall, and calcium always require boron in the cross members of the cell wall structure. So we get a lot of that happening at the root tip. And if you take a look at some of these diagrams, 
photograph, sorry, these show how the level of calcium is so high in the tip and also pH is also very high because we have issues in terms of pH differences between vacuoles and the cytoplasm. So that guides uh, the pollen tube along with a whole bunch of hormones into the micropile. So here's the pollen tube coming down. There's only one opening into the ovule. There's your two germ cells right here, sperm cells. One, uh, the tip breaks, one of those sperm cells goes to the egg, forms the germ. The other one forms, uh, unites with these two polar cells and forms the endosperm. Each one have, have their own genetic material and development. And, and there are uh, amino acids, this one here is called GABA, which are involved in the guidance of the pollen tube into the ovule. And once it's done, it, it won't accept another pollen tube and we have pollination. So now we have the kernel developing. So this is just a shot, uh, uh, seven days uh, after the start of anthesis. And this is a, 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 a floret, a seed, from the middle of a, of a head, and this is from the bottom. So the middle gets pollinated first, so it's two or three days ahead of the bottom spikelet. And you can see here, there's, there's all that stigma stuff, and here's the actual uh, uh, filament of the anther. So then the head starts, or the seed starts to develop. This is your second opportunity to increase protein in wheat. Because once pollination takes place, the seed starts, uh, or the plant starts filling the seed. And this is called the water ripe stage, right here, stage 71. This is a little bit bigger, but in this stage, you notice there's no, no structure to it. It's just filling it full of nutrients and, and, and going to biosynthesize the amyloplast for storage of endosperm and so on. And then the seed starts forming and eventually it gets mature. So let's take a look at that. Here's the water ripe stage. You can see it's just the juice bag. These two are bigger than all the rest, just like usual, because in the end, that's what happens. This is the point about six to seven days after pollination, where if you put on nitrogen, that most of that nitrogen that goes into the leaves will not be staying there because the plant is moving it up into the seed and anything that gets on the seed can easily be translocated into, this, into those kernels and in the water ripe stage and be incorporated into the amyloplast for storage. And these are just those seeds taken out so you can see the difference. Now, I showed you this early and then I put it in again because at this point in time, the plant is moving nutrients from the root, from the bottom leaves, from the stem into the head. Now, the leaf will contribute about 57%, the stem 31 and the head through the, the photosynthesis on the glooms and on the ons and so on does some work. Now, the plant has to do it that way because it's going to move it from the roots because that's the furthest away from the head and it needs the stem. Then it's going to take the bottom leaves, move it into the stem because the stem is key. Then it'll take the last part out of the stem and the very last part on the weak uh, stem that's green, is the very small portion be below the head. After that point in time, uh, it's moved everything into it and all that's left is any green on the head to add additional nutrients. So you can see that the uh, flag leaf and the penultimate are really big in terms of applying nutrients. The stem is also big because that's where it all accumulates in the stem in the end going up to the, to the head. And then the head should be the last thing that gets green or, or dies off. Okay, so here's that water ripe part and then it's moving on to the uh, milk stage. You can see here, this moves very quickly into forming the germ is now forming. We're getting on uh, too late for getting our proteins up anymore because all these cells are already formed and largely filled. You can see this the, while it's still green though, the endosperm, and you can see in that seed that I showed you germinating early, there's your already your coleoptile for next year and your radical also for next year that is done by the late milk stage. We're gonna go now into ripening. 
Here's the early dough. Ah, this is a little tricky, tricky one for me getting this one right. Uh, you can see that that's starting to form. You've seen those kind of light brown seeds, the soft dough stage. It's still soft, but it's, uh, you know, you can see some juice inside of it, some uh, cells that haven't been fully formed. The hard dough stage where you can still put a dent in it, but really you're not uh, gonna be breaking that uh, seed at all at this point in time, telling you it's getting close to maturity. And then finally ripening and senescence, where during the daytime, the uh, cells or the, <clears throat> the lemma and pella, because I don't know what else to call them, are starting to loosen around the kernel, getting ready for harvest. And then you, depending on how tough harvesting it is and how loose the, the glooms or the uh, florets are exposed here in terms of that late stage of mortality, depends how easy it is to combine. And lastly, you got your seed. So we've taken it from the beginning to the end. Uh, I hope I provided some uh, useful information and uh, wheat is, is a crop that's made for this country. It's got great roots. Uh, we can put a lot of nutrients down with it because it's pretty tough. We can put it in the seed row without uh, being too damaging. Uh, and I've talked a little bit about you know, uh, things you can do from a stress management point of view. Uh, I just summarize that uh, whenever I speak about plants, I always talk about photosynthesis and stress management because I think uh, my belief is that if we look after those and about all we can do is protect it and supply nutrients uh, at various uh, points in time, like, uh, you know, uh, to reduce stress at herbicide, going into early flower, uh, if we're tissue testing, soil testing, and then the next phase is to take actually nutrient density, which I showed you early, to get a complete picture of how to properly feed our plants and what the plants are telling us about what they're short. So with that, uh, thank you very much and um, hope you have a great day.